So, so really, this is not just a one-time thing. If you get out of the room and you go, what was he talking about? He, he said something that was really useful. Almost every piece of information, I've sourced it on the slide. So you'll be able to look it all up and, and go do your own research if people start asking you questions in your job. So my, my work usually involves mostly the front end. And so we are the people yelling at all the DevOps guys who are, seem to always not, never give us the resources we really need. And, and, and for the front end guys, this is usually the, the feeling we get. You know, what we've got here is fine. The problem is it's not being distributed fast enough or you know, well enough or reliably enough. Um, and that's probably un, unfair to some extent. You'll see some examples of that uh, in this presentation where, gee, maybe the front end guys need to get their act together. Um, part of getting the act together is actually to kind of revisit um, what's going on. I'm sorry, it looks like we're a little bit off center here. Uh, that might be a bit of a problem because there's quite a bit of it missing. Let me, uh, hold on a sec, let's. All right, so the, uh, the HTTP protocol it really goes back to the very beginning of, um, of the internet. If you look, uh, in 1991, the web protocol 0.9, really there wasn't another big update until 1996. And then quickly thereafter, because every major version release has a lot of bugs, uh, quickly thereafter, HTTP 1.1 came out. And that's really where we started, uh, where we've been since 1997, uh, almost 20 years that went by uh, without any kind of major upgrade to our protocol. And when you think about what's happened in the meantime, you know, this is the state of the art of web page design in 1997. It's, it's Space Jam that laid out with tables. And obviously we've come a long way in every part of the web in 20 years, yet we're still using the same protocol for delivering the bytes to the server and, and across many other things. I mean, the, the HTTP protocol is used everywhere nowadays. Um, but fortunately, people have been thinking about this the last five years or so, and they've been working on an upgrade. And of course, it's always tricky because you want something that's uh, backward compatible, the handshake needs to upgrade, but still leave the ability for HTTP 1.1 to work since a lot of devices won't be updated or can't be updated. So we have to accept both protocols. The, the first um, thing that happened that kind of started the ball rolling was the Google folks started looking and they said, you know, we've really got to solve this problem because the bottleneck between our servers and the client is causing a lot of performance issues. So they came out with Speedy, um, in 2011, and they not only implemented it for Chrome, but they implemented it on most of their servers as well. So it made things faster. And obviously it's, you know, it wasn't standard, but everybody else saw what was going on, and so most of the other browsers followed suit very quickly and, and supported Speedy. So by 2012, a lot of major all the major browsers and Google servers were using Speedy. And uh, here's the state of the art today. You can see uh, IE 11 is clipped off the edge there, but it's, uh, it's supporting uh, Speedy as well. But you can see all the green here. There's a couple outliers. The major outlier is this UC browser for Android that's really popular in China. But a lot of the infrastructure in China can't support HTTP 2.0, uh, and their great firewall uh, would block a lot of it anyway, since it would be insecure HTTPS. So really, if you look right now, Speedy is pretty much supported everywhere except Opera Mini and this UC browser in China. Uh, it's also, I think, popular in India. But. We wanted to go a little further than that, or at least the industry wanted to go a little further than that. Yes, we have Speedy, and it's pretty well supported. Uh, not too long after it was announced, a, a group of involved parties, including all the browser makers uh, and some of the big uh, 
device makers started standardization efforts. In 2015, they pretty much completed the spec and it is being implemented and deployed. You'll see a lot of uh, things in the coming slides about how complete it is. Uh, and actually, Chrome is still, uh, I'm actually pretty surprised, they're still saying that in May they will remove Speedy support from Chrome. So we are very close to seeing the end of Speedy uh, on Chrome. Uh, they want to do that, and they're trying to be aggressive with it because they don't want people to lean back on Speedy support. They don't want that to stop HTTP 2.0 from being implemented by many other people. So it's very possible that you're going to see degradations if, if Chrome doesn't backtrack, and it wouldn't surprise me if they backtrack for a couple more months, but if, if they were to do this, then come June, you're going to, you might hear people saying, hey, wait a minute, your servers, you know, if you're supporting Speedy, they might be saying, your site seems slower than it was last month. And that would be because if you're not supporting HTTP 2.0, you're losing Speedy. So fortunately, at least on the browser side, again, we've got pretty good support here. Um, off to the edge, uh, off to the corner that's been cut off here, IE 11 does not have uh, 2.0 support unless you're on Windows 10. Um, because in Windows, the protocol support is tied to the operating system and not the browser. But you see pretty much green across the board, except for the Android browser. A lot of Android users are now on Chrome, so that's not as much of an issue. Uh, again, you see the Android browser being a problem uh, primarily in uh, India, China, places like that, because UC Browser and Android Browser don't support um, 2.0 yet. But again, you can support 2.0 uh, really well and still support your 1.1 customers. They're going to come through and they'll just get the 1.1 experience. So it's not an either or. All right, so here we have a really big, uh, and I also highly recommend this, uh, is TLS fast yet? It gives you this. Um, this matrix of uh, technologies that and whether they support all of the TLS uh, factors that are available. So uh, this is uh, clipped off, but like Apache, for example, supports it. Uh, HA proxy, I think it's on the next slide, but um, uh, HA proxy should be here. It is right, right here. HA proxy says it doesn't, but I believe last I checked. HA proxy supports TLS pass through, which means that you can use a HTTP2 device behind HA proxy and get HTTP2 uh, support. But you can see it's pretty green there. That last column shows that you know most uh, people are already supporting 2.0, and uh, I think especially once Chrome drops support for Speedy, that you're going to see more. Um, Here's some similar results for CDNs and platform as a service provider. Um, they uh, support it pretty well. The major troublemakers here are Amazon. Uh, it does not yet support uh, 2.0, and I don't know when what their timeline is for that. You can see a few of them support only Speedy. So for at least for the next month, uh, you'll get HTTP 2.0 like performance uh, on those. And I think I've got to imagine that th those people have 2.0 support all the way because otherwise they're going to get their customers complaining that performance has gone down. So, so maybe what Chrome is doing is right after all. Uh, there's quite a few services, uh, cost you know, uh, uh, customer facing, uh, user facing services out there that are using HTTP 2.0. This is the kind of thing that you can say, hey, they're doing it, we should do it too. Uh, blogging sites, I just chose uh, at random, but WordPress, Blogger, and Medium are all using 2.0. Tumblr is using Speedy right now. Um, and here's some other information that may be useful to you when you're actually going to look at other implementations of the protocol. So why do we need it? Uh, it's faster, but how is it faster? Why is it faster? Uh, the, the main problem we have with uh, 1.0 is that the connections are pretty dumb. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can do, 
as a content provider. If you're on the client side, you can write things to try to optimize these uh, these connections. And you know, it's things like okay, you, you want to minify, you can domain shard, you can get, you can combine files so you have fewer requests and fewer round trip delays. You can mess with the order of things in the files so that the browser requests them in a better order. Uh, you can request some things later with XML HTTP request. You know, you can make multiple connections to the server. All of these things are really just kind of hacks. I mean, we, we've lived with them for 20 years to the point where we just, you know, that's the way you make things fast. You mess around with all of this. But it's really, it, it's not, it, it's not ideal because a lot of times people don't do these things. Um, the main problem is that late, latency is our is the killer. You know, we just have the more times that you have to wait an entire round trip delay, especially on mobile or on any kind of long delay thing like a satellite connection, um, the worse it gets. Uh, and, you know, if you look at most uh, planes, I, you know, I came over from the United States. We're using a satellite connection, and you know, it feels like one of those first world problems to complain that your internet is slow as you fly around the entire globe. But it is annoying when you have those long round trip delays because latency is the problem. It just takes a second to get up to the satellite and back down again. Um, the way H2, one of the ways that HTTP 2.0 solves this problem is it is no longer something that you can just connect up with Telnet say, oh, I want to act like I'm the requester for these things. Uh, and since this is a DevOps thing, I'm going to ask people to raise their hand about whether they use Telnet a lot for HTTP connection testing. Yeah, see, there's more hands here than there usually are on the front end, guys. Some, some people are like, what's Telnet? So, um, so this, you know, when was the last time you did that? Well, you're going to have to stop doing that. You're going to have to start depending on some tools because um, you can't use Telnet to just establish a connection that way. Uh, but we are lucky. There's plenty of tools out there already. Uh, the browser dev tools can do it. Wireshark Shark can decoder, uh, decode it. So we're in pretty good shape tool-wise. People are prepared for this. Um, although it's possible for the protocol to be done over an unencrypted connection, nobody has implemented it right now as far as I know. Uh, to do so. Um, I believe with HA proxy it actually unwraps the connection and then sends it on unencrypted, but there is nobody who does uh, HTTP 2.0 not over TLS. So it, it really is kind of surprising when you think about it. You start with another kind of handicap of the, uh, the encryption handshake that you didn't have with 1.0 but it still ends up being faster in most cases. We'll see some actual graphs that some people have done to show that it, for, for a reasonable latency, uh, even with the extra overhead of encryption, it is faster. So the round trip time delays that I mentioned, uh, this is kind of a graphical representation of the problem. Um, when you're, when you're Making a request, I'm sure everybody's kind of aware of how HTTP works. You've got the browser making multiple requests. If there's something big at the head of the line, then we're kind of waiting for this 500 KB to come down, even though possibly the page could show, if I could just show this little icon and this CSS, and, and this JavaScript probably has to run before any of this stuff. So the unfortunate thing is, whatever order you make the requests in, they just all have to come down in whatever order it was, even if it turned out being non-optimal. And you have to wait a round trip time delay between resources being requested. Not good. So with 2.0, we solved that problem because we have something called streams. We have a connection, but we have multiple resources being downloaded on that connection, and each one is considered to be a stream. And streams can be prioritized. They can be canceled if you decide you no longer need them. And they're also preemptible. So a good example of that is we have this large image that's coming down, but the browser realizes later, as it's looking through the list, that it really would prefer to have 
uh, the CSS and JS files come down sooner because as soon as they're down, it can actually render the page. So when it sends these requests, it asks for the files in these order, in this order, but it can say, this is a much more important resource to me. I need info.js as soon as you can give it to me. The server can preempt this stream here, immediately deliver these two very small files, and then resume this stream later. Uh, that is all controllable by the browser, and it doesn't matter what order the resources are mentioned in, what matters is their priority. So the other, another problem you end up with with headers uh, in HTTP 1.0 is that headers are not compressed. The content to be compressed is gzip, but the headers are not compressed. And you know a perfect example of this is cookies. Um, again, people go cookie crazy, right? So uh, everybody says, yeah, the web is stateless. Well, we'll have to send the state with everything. So we send two or three K worth of cookies every time. Same with the user agent. Now, when you're making a connection, the user agent never changes when you're for that browser, but every one of your uh, requests sends the user agent. This one is a typical 124 bytes, and the, and the user agents just keep getting longer and longer because they have to keep stuffing more lies in it. I'm Mozilla, no, I'm Apple WebKit, no, I'm Chrome, I'm Safari. So this problem just gets worse, and we keep sending more and more duplicate bytes. With, with HPAC compression, what we do is we have a, t we have a table, here are the headers that we want to send on a particular request. Uh, the protocol has a static table that has some information that's always there, like method, get, it's so common. And then also things that get populated in the table as the connection is proceeding. So things like the user agent that will be different from browser to browser get uh, put here. And then when I make a request, uh, if, I, if the method is get, rather than sending M-E-T-H-O-D colon space G-E-T character term line feed, I just send two. I just send you know, a byte saying, here, that, that's what it is, it's, it's two, method get. And you can see that in the, with the encoded headers, we only really need to send newly defined headers and then those get put in the static table so that, again, they aren't going to have to be sent any other way. One interesting thing about this Huffman coding <coughs> is it's actually not as good as the encoding that's being used by um, Speedy, but there have been some vulnerabilities that were detected in Speedy's compression algorithm that could cause denial, denial of service, particularly on the server side. So one of the things they did is they said, we are going to use the most simple, straightforward proto, you know, uh, encoding scheme here because we would rather have it be safe uh, and we know that it terminates than to have something that could be used as an attack vector. So here's a list of kind of best practices that, uh, that client developers are all often told to do. And you can kind of, we're going to kind of revisit some of these things and take a look and see whether they still make sense uh, when we're talking about HTTP uh, 2.0. Um, this is the HuffingtonPost.com. I used Webpage Test, which is an excellent tool for seeing what a real life connection to a website would be. It simulates a browser and it can simulate a connection speed. And Huffington Post takes forever. So just to define what forever is, this is the beginning of the connection, and then it starts requesting a bunch of resources, and then it requests a lot of resources, and then it requests some more resources. So uh, 240 requests, 3.8 megabytes. So getting on to about four megabytes of data for this web page to download. It's not that good. Now, there's a lot of poor practices in here, but uh, you know, if you're a DevOps guy, you know that sometimes the guys who are writing the, the software that goes into the website, you know, they've got their constraints as well. So they may not want to include those 15 different tracking things, but the marketing guys insist that it's absolutely necessary to have you know, five different you know, click trackers. Um, so one of the tricks that 
uh, that a lot of times we've been using since the beginning of time is domain charting. And the idea there was we only get four or six connections per domain. So what we need to do is figure out a way to kind of have the same server accessible by multiple domains so that we can get more bandwidth to overcome those latencies that we have in HTTP 1.1. Um, so, you know, that kind of works, but you know, each one of the connection has to be warmed up. We have, we have the, the problem of needing to make the window bigger and TCP is designed not to just like open the floodgates immediately. It's kind of like, can you take more? Can you take more? And why that, while that connection is warming up, we're not getting full performance out of the connection. Um, and even on HTTP 1.1, performance is often harmed by more than two shards. So let's just look at the case where two different domains are actually pointing at the same server and we're trying to squeeze more bandwidth out of it. Well, it turns out, even for that simple case, that for this site, the people who set up the sharding really didn't ever go and look at whether it helped. Because if you look, uh, s.helppost.com and i.helppost.com um, don't really overlap. You could, these are, this is a showing each one of the connections. And you see we have, uh, looks like, four to six connections per server, but we're not really using them in an overlapped way, so we weren't really getting more bandwidth out of them. i.huffpost.com got used a lot, and then s.huffpost.com got used a lot. And then we used AOL CDM, but we hardly got any files off of it, so that was kind of a wasted set of connections. Um, plus, you know, the ultimate question is, you know, if you were making maximal use of your connection, you would see this little green line sitting right up here at the top. But we don't. Instead, we see that there's this huge delay to begin with, and then frantic activity, and then there's almost a three-second period where we're hardly doing anything on the wire. So, again, not a very efficient use of the resources that we had available to us. So one of the things that's really great about uh, 2.0 is that if you have a TLS certificate and it's valid for multiple DNS names, like it's a wildcard certificate, and the names resolve to the same IP address, then HTTP 2.0 can use the same connection for both hosts. So it automatically coalesces your sharded domain. So if you feel like for your 1.0 host that you have tested and sharding two domains makes it faster for those uh, hosts and, and servers and uh, clients, you can continue to do that. But if you support HTTP 2.0, you can automatically collapse those to make a better and faster connection for the 2.0 situation. Um, one of the other reasons why people have multiple domains pointing at the same um, server and the, uh, the same IP is so that you can not deliver cookies. Well, remember, we have a way of reducing the overhead of cookies by having header compression. If the cookies aren't changing, then you'll never send the cookies over and over again. It'll be reduced to that one number in the header. So you don't really need to shard domains to avoid cookie overhead anymore. If, if you have a, a wildcard certificate for your domains, that problem goes away. Um, one of the other things that, that is very popular is combining scripts uh, via some server-side technique. Uh, in this case, it's PHP, uh, and you can see the request for the URL is actually the names of all the files that you want to glom together. And there's this funny little V equals something, and that's your cache buster. That's the one that tells you, you know, if you increment that number, it'll force the thing to regenerate an entire new set of information. The problem you run into there is that you're delivering all of this as one big lump. All it takes is the need to change one byte in that lump. And now you've invalidated the cache for every one of these files. And if you look, there was one here, there was a configuration. Here it is, config.js. Well, usually configurations change on a regular basis, but you know, more likely, uh, you know, maybe the ads change as well. So you don't really want to combine files like this if they change 
often. If they're never going to change for a month, it may be safe to do this. So it is good to rethink it when you start talking about a protocol like 2.0 that is pretty good at delivering small files. You, you usually don't need the entire set of data that you pull down. You probably only need what you, like when you're doing your initial render, you just want to get the basic JavaScript and CSS and images that it takes to do that first render so the user is occupied with their eyeballs. And then four or five seconds can go by, but they're looking at what they already see. So don't combine everything into giant files. Um, it's better uh, to use what I call a core than more strategy. I don't know if that's, that rhymes in Italian as well. But, um, but the idea is to have something where only your essential files are combined and those files should handle the above the fold initial view that you're looking at. And then everything else can come in as needed asynchronously. Uh, for example, if you've got a dialogue that comes up when you add something to the cart, you know, it's not going to be, the user is going to be looking at something for a couple of seconds before the add to cart button shows up. So in that case, just wait and deliver all of that information later. Um, also avoid inlining JavaScript and CSS. That has been that best practice in HTTP 1.0. The idea that, you know, that first initial render, you wanted to try to get it by stuffing the JavaScript and CSS into the page. That's not needed for 2.0 either. Uh, in, inlining can cause useless rendering. So what happens is the browser gets to script and says, oh, I'm gonna have to switch over to my script interpreter. Maybe I can show something to the user and you end up with things being rendered that are incomplete and confusing uh, to the user. Now there's one part of HTTP 2.0 that really hasn't been widely explored, but I think is going to be the killer app uh, the implementations that I know of don't really do this uh, very effectively or don't implement it at all. But the idea is the browser can say, I want a specific resource, in this case, say, products.html, which is a uh, full page. And the server can say, I know from experience that every time somebody asks for this file, they also want this file. And you can start sending that um, automatically. And when you think about like above the fold.css, maybe it's only like one K, so it's not going to be even that bad if the user has it cached. You can just send it along. By the time it gets there, you know, the, the browser can accept it. This can be done predictively on the server side. You can look at stats of what's requested by the browser in what order. And you can, at the, on the server side, without even knowing the structure of the files that that were built by the uh, client developer, you can actually predictively know what they're going to ask for. You just watch the connection. So I, I think you're going to see more of this happening, where people will start to build tools that let you do this, and those will improve performance. It's pretty impressive. Um, here is a little experiment uh, that someone did to show the difference between a uh, HTTP 1.0, where you see all these little files being requested. This is why we decided why we best practice in 1.0 was to combine files. But you can see that in 2.0, with server push, essentially the files come and as quickly as it can, it just sends them all at once. Um, and essentially, there's because these files are so small, it really didn't take any additional time, and it reduced load time by 60 percent. So again, there's a lot of uh, possible improvements that we haven't even seen occur here. Here's an Nginx benchmark showing how uh, HTTP 1.1 compares to 2.0 and to HTTPS. And you can see that really up until about a 300 millisecond round trip time, HTTP 2.0 is faster, even considering it's encrypted. It's faster than unencrypted HTTP. It's only when you get to the long round trip times that it becomes uh, slower, but it's still much faster than HTTPS. So, not so bad. Um, you know, the, the 
The benefits down here, when you're talking, especially when you're talking about you know, broadband connections or potentially fast uh, mobile connections, are, are pretty high. So you may wonder exactly how a browser decides to prioritize the connection uh, data that it has. Um, what you can do uh, here is, uh, looking at the stream, the browser decides the priority, and it can also say, not only is this a high priority or low priority, but it depends on some other resources I've already asked you for. So it basically creates a dependency tree. Um, this is one such dependency tree that is kind of a back of the envelope drawing that uh, one of the Firefox developers created, uh, just to give you an idea of how that works. Um, how are we doing on time? Five, ten minutes. Okay. Um, sorry, can't really see my screen very well. Um, so for, for best performance, uh, you want to try to minimize uh, the number of concurrent connections. Remembering that for HTTP 2.0, you want one big wide pipe that's as fast as you can get it to be. You only have to warm that connection up once. So to, to make sure that you get best performance, you want to delay use of other domains, mostly until the main connection is idle. So don't try to parallel four or five different domain requests. Uh, only use a public CDN if you're getting a significant number of bytes there. Don't do like the example that we saw where they used AOL CDN and they got two relatively small files from it. You want to, if you choose a CDN, make sure your CDN has all the files you want and there are a lot of bytes. Otherwise, you're much better served by putting those files on your own domain so that you can use it through the same connection. So here are a few little screenshots just to give you an idea of what browser tools look like. Um, in Chrome, in the, in the dev tools, you can right click on this and select um, that you want to see the protocol that was used. I don't believe it's selected by default, but it's really easy to get it in the network display. Firefox, uh, you look at the, uh, you do the inspection of a specific request and you'll see the, the version of the protocol that was used. And then on Edge, it's also shown here, one of the little quirks with Edge is when you request something and it comes from cache, it just tells you it's secure, but it doesn't know what protocol was used to put it in the cache. There's also a uh, HTTP2 and Speedy indicator that you can get as a Chrome plugin, and I believe there's a Firefox plugin as well. This tells you if the HTML file was requested with uh, HTTP 2, remembering that you can mix them all. So your ad network, for example, may be HTTP 1.1, but it would still show this as a uh, as using HTTP 2 because the file came, the main file came, and you can make them exist. So I hope I got the uh, the Italian there right. Um, so you, you, there's no problem with mixing the 2.0 and 1.0 protocols. You, you've got your option to, to put them in the same file and have no problem mixing them. But again, if you're using uh, multiple connections, try to get your main data from your 2.0 connection in before you start requesting things from other connections. So here's a few to-dos for you. Uh, first of all, ensure that you have uh, support in your servers, your CDNs, and you probably already have had it in your browsers. Make HTTP2 effective without breaking version one. Reduce or eliminate your sharding. Uh, avoid creating one big JS or CSS file. Break them into two or three smaller pieces. Um, and then make sure that you're getting that HTTP2 goodness. Uh, there's still some studies on that are going on, and I think we will see improvements for things like uh, server push. So there's some work going on here, but you should definitely test and see that it's improved your performance for your situation. Again, this talk is available online. You can go. Uh, whatever questions you ask me, improve the presentation. I try to make it better. And you can always reach me on Twitter. Thank you very much. <laughs>